Missions of mercy. What a phrase. Thank you for that, Ryan. Thank you for the song selection. I say we wrap this thing up and go on some missions of mercy. Anybody in? We want to worship God and we want to spread the mercies of the Lord into the lives of those who need it, which will be our topic for today in Luke, the 15th chapter. Almost everything we will be doing is right here in these three stories that Jesus told in Luke 15. While you're getting set in that place, I want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing tonight. I'm sure Jimmy will mention something in the closing announcements, but tonight's service in terms of the presenting will be different than usual. We're getting near the end of the year and I'll be, you're not going to believe this, but I will be up here for under 20 minutes by law, contractually obligated to be done in under 20 minutes because the second half of our service presentation tonight will be one of the elders of this church presenting to you information about this year and about the good things that have happened in our church and about things that we can all be excited about heading into the new year and some wonderful things that are set up to come. Just a tremendously optimistic time for us tonight and one of our shepherds will be presenting that. For my part tonight, I just want to talk to you about preaching. One of the things I try to do every year is go back to First and Second Timothy and reevaluate what is preaching supposed to be? Am I doing my job? Am I doing it well? And how can I do it more efficiently and better? And I just want to share a little bit of that with you tonight, some of my personal findings with you tonight for a sense of accountability. If you agree with what you hear this evening, then I'm asking you to hold me and all of the preachers at this church accountable to do those things in the preaching. But there's also a sense of um, mutual accountability. Is that a fair statement? from the speaker and from the hearer. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about that this year, and some of it has come through in the preaching. I've been trying to figure out, am I doing the things that God wants me to do when I have an opportunity to stand behind this piece of wood? And, and some things have been showing up. Like I did a lesson earlier this year on level five maturity, where I talked to you about 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, and that it's a preacher's job to teach people so that they can become teachers. The idea is to edify others to present so that it's not always just one man or one spot that's doing all the feeding. He's empowering men and women to also be feeders of those who need mercy. Uh, you've seen some of that already. The gospel message book we do is about a teacher teaching it to students so that they can become teachers. In January, February, and March, we'll do a foundations book, a teacher teaching students so that they can become teachers of others to try to help them grow in the faith. And you've seen a lot of that as we've gone along. But something else that's really came through for me, and you heard about it a few weeks ago from Max's sermon. You guys remember Max's sermon, how big is Jesus in your eyes? And Jesus just kept getting bigger. I believe it's an important part of preaching to try to enlighten the eyes of your heart. To open your heart to receive the glory of the Lord, the power of the Lord, and the hope of the Lord. To receive it into your heart so that it can emotionally change your behavior. And that is something that I want to do better and I want you to pray that we can do that better. Because there are a lot of things in the Bible we intellectually know. Today is a perfect example. How many of you don't know the three stories of Luke 15? The story of the lost sheep the lost coin, and the lost son. And if preaching is about me standing up here for a half an hour, you're like, good luck with half an hour. But if I stood up here for half an hour and I said, hey, you guys remember these stories? Let me read these stories and show them to you. You came in knowing the stories and you left knowing the stories and we've wasted our time. The purpose, I think, of preaching and teaching is to ask you and help you open your heart to not just know these stories, but open the eyes of your heart to receive these stories into your innermost being and to love like God loves and to be merciful like God is merciful and to change your behavior, not from a checklist, but from the heart. And so I hope to do that today, and we'll talk more about that tonight, and I hope that you'll come and be a part of that. But I want you to not just know these stories, I want you to feel them as we move through this together for a few minutes. Are you in Luke chapter 15? Let's read these first two verses to set it up. Now, all of the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near Jesus to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. It's a very easy setting. Lost people all over are coming to Jesus because Jesus is on a mission of mercy. 
Jesus is on a mission to meet people where they are, to learn about them, to see them in their sinful place, and out of pure love for them, to try to show them the way to heaven. And the Pharisees ain't having it. It doesn't fit their mold. It doesn't fit the way that they work. It doesn't fit their tradition, and they reject it. And so Jesus says, please listen carefully. I'm going to tell you three stories. And these stories are designed to not only show you what I'm doing, but to change you into people who will do it also. You know these stories really, really well. We have one lost sheep out of a hundred. They're kind of interesting. I'm a bit of a math nerd and they have this mathematical element to them. You have one sheep out of a hundred. So a man loses 1% of his flock. What does he do about that? Then a woman loses 10% of her money, which starts to kind of ratchet up that intensity. Maybe you don't care about one sheep out of 100, which is kind of the point. You'll see it in a minute. But what if you lost 10% of all your money? Would you do anything about that? And so he ratchets it up a little bit. And then in the third story, the one we know the best, the prodigal son, he says, what if you lost half your, your kids? What if you only had two children and one of them was gone? How would you feel about that? And what would you do? And what would it mean when they return? So I want to take a look at these three stories with you. And here's what we learn. It's really simple. The points are super simple. When someone who belongs to God leaves God, it hurts God. When someone turns to sin, our God feels it. He made you, he made your soul, he made your soul to connect to his soul, and he feels that pain. But when they return, when you return, if that's where this lesson is going today, when you help someone in your family to return, God receives them. Those are the two big points of the lesson. When we turn from him, it hurts God. When we turn back to him, he receives us. He does not judge us when we return to him. He does not ask us to pay restitution, to make it right again. He just takes you back. And for people who have drifted out into this world and they have felt their own inadequacy and they have seen that on their own they are failures, that is what you need to hear today. That God is not asking you to prove yourself. He's asking you to come home. And that's the impetus of all three of these stories, and I'm going to show it to you in the verses that are at the end of each one. Verse 7. Let's just skip to the, to the point. After the story of the sheep, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. God cares about every single person. You ever feel like you get lost in the crowd? Pretty big church here at Lindale. You kind of get lost in your pew. There are a lot of people who live in your town, who go to your school, who live in your neighborhood, and you're just one little person. And you start feeling inadequate. That's a good feeling. But you start feeling unimportant. That's a bad feeling. Because God cares about every single one and rejoices. If you find him, he rejoices because you are important to him. Verse 10. He tells the story of the woman who lost one of her coins. And in verse 10, he says, In the same way I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then the most telling of the stories. You know, I think we like the prodigal son story the best because it's people and they all have little speaking roles. But really, it's, it's kind of turning to a, a, a simpler explanation. I think the sheep one is probably my favorite one, and I'll tell you about why in a minute. And it's the one least understood by people. Makes the least amount of sense to people because man's ways and God's ways are different. But by the time you get to the lost son, like everybody here gets it. You lost your, your child. Your child is dead in the world and comes home. Pick up in verse 20. So he got up and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran to him and embraced him and kissed him. And the son starts talking. You know, I don't think the father's saying anything. He's just holding him, you know, he's just squeezing him tight. And the son comes in and starts talking. And, and he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father says to his slaves, quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand. 
put sandals on his feet. Do you get it? His jewelry's gone. His shoes are gone. He's limping in with pig goo all over him. Go get this man a robe, a ring, put sandals on his feet, bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found and they began to celebrate. I don't know who needs to hear it today, but I'm preaching it anyway. If anything, anyone has taken you away from God, you may be still sitting in the pew every week. You know your life. Or you may be back visiting us after a long time away from God's people. Just know that it hurt while you were gone and all He wants is for you to come back. And He will rejoice and He will embrace you. And you're like, well, I don't, I don't have anything to bring. I know, you blew it all. But you don't have to bring anything. Just you. He just wants you. How many of you know that God can provide everything that you need? That He can give you all that is important. So I want to take a look at these stories. That's the main idea here is penitence, missions of mercy for people who are seeking mercy beyond this life. Let's look at the stories because each one of them is going to add this really great little layer. And maybe one will hit you more than the other, but all of them are valuable. Go back to the beginning of the chapter. I'm just going to read verses three through seven. First story, a man has a hundred sheep. One of them loses its way. You know that sheep and shepherd imagery is super common in the Old Testament and the New to represent God's people. Here we go. So he told them this parable saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now this story confuses me. You say, what's confusing about that? I've never been a shepherd. So let me start there. But he opens up with this assumption that if you had a hundred sheep and what man of you If he lost 1% of his flock, if he lost one sheep, which one of you would not leave all the rest and go and find the one? Me, I guess. I don't know. It's just one sheep. Like, it's one dumb sheep. It's one. I've got 99 sheep. Sheep make sheep, you know. Sheep make sheep. And I can replace that one pretty quickly with just a little bit of patience. Like, I'm not going after one sheep. By the way, they're so dumb. Like, it's just going to wander off again. And, and he, he's not going to find his way back. And, and just why would I do that? That's kind of the point. I think this story is a clearer picture of God than even the other two. Because we don't understand it. Who does that? He said, that's what God does. And you know, when we think about the story of the prodigal, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. We'll get to the prodigal in a moment. But the prodigal almost makes it look like the son leaves God and God's like, I'm not coming to get you. I'm going to wait right here. I'll be looking. But whenever you're ready, I'm not coming to get you. I'm not searching you out. I'm not checking on you. If your picture of God is when you've gone into the sins of the world, that God's just crossed his arms and said, well, you know where I am if you want me. You don't know God almost at all. Listen to this story. The sheep was not going to find his way home. The sheep cannot find his way home. The shepherd loves the one in an almost irrational way to love the one. And it says that he goes out, he leaves these and he goes after him and he finds him and he puts him on his shoulders and he rejoices and he comes back home and he calls up all of his friends. and He's like, guys, I found that one dumb sheep. Let's throw a party. And they're like, who would throw a party over that? Who cares about the one? You know, sometimes in the church, we think very collectively, like, ooh, the Lindale church is doing good. And the Lindale church has a lot of people. If we start thinking of ourselves as one flock in a sense that loses the value of one person, we have lost our concept of God. Because God loves every soul and he throws this great joy. Now you might say, Christian, you need to be careful with your language here because you almost make it sound like when you leave that God goes and grabs you and brings you back. But we all know that you have to choose to repent. 
that He's not just going to come and grab you and throw you over His shoulders and take you home. Well, I know that and you know that because the text told us that. Verse 7 told us, you repent. Verse 10 told us, you repent. Verses 20 through 24 told us, you repent. But would you please not lose the fact that God is still searching for you? That God has not just left you abandoned, that He is seeking for you and He wants to find you and He cares. And you say, well, how does that work? Well, go to John 10. I want to show you some shepherd sheep imagery that I found very helpful for this. If you're someone who's lost your way in your walk, and I think that these stories have two broad applications. It could be someone who was a Christian and fell away. I think this story applies to them. You're a Christian and you've fallen away. Or it could apply to someone who's never been a Christian because when you were young, like the Jews, you, were, you belonged to God. And when you became of an age of accountability, you left God. It's all kind of the same in that way. But if you did that, God has come looking for you. You say, well, what do you mean by that? I mean that he is calling your name and I'm asking you today if you can hear him. Do you see the shepherd walking around calling the sheep? He's probably just sheep. It's like sheep, you know, sheep. He's using his voice to try to call his name. The sheep can't find his way home, but the sheep can hear the master's voice. And in John chapter 10, verse 1, you get this really great imagery that matches Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he's a thief, he's a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When, when he has put forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they hear his voice. A stranger, they will not follow. They'll flee from the voice of a stranger because they don't know the voice of strangers. Well, here's what's happening. There are people who've left God because they have listened to the voice of strangers. They have listened to the voice of their friends in the world. They have listened to promises made by people who cannot keep those promises, and they've been led away. I completely believe that Jesus has come to find you, and that He is calling your name with His voice, and that no matter how insignificant you feel, you are that valuable to the Lord. Now, the big question is, how does He do that? Is He going to whisper into my ear? Well, you probably heard me talk about this before, but in our age, the Lord calls your name by three things that start with the letter P. You know them? Number one, every time you open this book, the passages on these pages is the voice of Jesus calling your name. Number two, people. How many of you have drifted from God and people have come to talk to you? How many of you have drifted from God and some person in your life has sought to wake you up? God is calling your voice, your name with his voice. He's calling your name. So there are passages and people, and I think my favorite, because I know the least about it, is providence. There are people who are out away from God and Jesus is standing right next to them. He's followed them in this way and he just wants to show them I'm right here and I'll carry you home. And through providential circumstances, through hardship or blessings, he some way tries to open our eyes. There are three stories here. And the first one to me represents the Lord better than all the rest because man doesn't understand why one would matter out of a hundred and one always matters to Jesus. My question to you is, can you hear him? Really, there's two points of application here. If you're a Christian, do you hear his voice? And if you've lost your way, do you hear him calling you home? The Lord loves the sinner that much. Well, the second story seems very similar, almost as if it's just a redundancy, but a couple of things have changed, I think. Let's go back to our text and read it. Back in Luke, the 15th chapter, one of the things you're going to note is we change from a man to a woman, which I believe has some real significance today. We change from a sheep to a coin, and we change from 1% of your flock to 10% of your income, which would draw more attention to the Jewish hearer because now it's starting to get personal. Well, pick up with me in verse 8. He says, or what woman, if she has 10 silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and her neighbors saying, rejoice with me, for I found the coin which was lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. All right. Of all the study I had the opportunity to do last week, the study that I put in and the things that I learned about this story are what are going to stick with me long after this sermon is over. 
First of all, it's kind of odd to talk about women. In the Jewish culture, it was usually about the man. The man is ordinarily the only one discussed. He is the husband. He is the head of the household. He's the guy who works. He's the guy who makes money. And yet he says, I want to talk to the ladies a moment, the, the wives, the mothers who are at home. Which one of you women at home, if you had 10 coins and lost one, would not yearn for it? Let me tell you a little something about first century Palestinian culture. When a man would marry a woman, he would give her a gift. Not a wedding ring like today. He would give her a necklace with 10 coins on it. This was like their, their covenant piece. This is a significant explanation to others of their marriage. This says, this says, I belong to him. And so it would have these 10 pieces. And it was so important that if he died, she would give it back to the family. Like it had that kind of family connection. She has lost one of those 10 coins. She is set to be dishonored. There is a possibility that when he finds out that she has lost a part of what connects her to him, that she will be put away until she finds it. She has lost a part of herself. And she belongs to him. How urgently is she searching the house? How many candles are burning? How many corners of the home is she sweeping? She needs to find this coin. She needs it because she answers to her husband for it. Now, on the one hand, the application is really simple. God loves you like that. God loves you like you are a part of him, like you are one of his own, like you complete that relationship and he yearns for it. And in a sense, when even one person falls away from his church, his church is now incomplete because you're not in it anymore. Whoever you are, please hear me. The beauty of his church is incomplete if you're not in it anymore because you were in it. And you were a part of it. So there's the one application. But here's something even better. Even better. All right, word association time. I'm going to say something. You tell me who it represents. The shepherd. Who does the shepherd of the first story represent? Jesus. I mean, the shepherd is Jesus. The shepherd's always Jesus. Third story. The father represents... I mean, take off my coat and come down. I can do some things to get you to talk. The father is God the father, right? So if, if the shepherd is Jesus who came and got you and the father is the father, it's, I don't think it's the Holy Spirit if that's going to help you with this. Who is the woman? How many of you know that consistently in the New Testament, the bride of Christ is his what? It's his church. This woman is his church. This woman is, is Kyle. This woman is Chris and his family and Veronica. I found some really interesting things on this. Uh, there's a guy in the back, got some old commentaries in the back, guy named Linsky. He wrote this. He said, by this woman, Jesus pictures the church, which is filled with the same spirit as her Lord, seeking the lost and rejoicing over those who are found. I feel like I'm about to lose my way on this sermon. Just go with me. The main point I wanted to give to you today is that God loves every single soul and that he's on missions of mercy and that he seeks everyone out and that he, he puts all hands on deck and he goes as far as it takes and he just wants you to come home. But now I want you to see that that's how we're supposed to be. That's what his church is supposed to be. We're supposed to be a people who when one soul falls away, we go and get them. You say, well, you can't take them against their will. Jesus didn't either, but he certainly called their voice. He certainly beckoned for their voice and he welcomed them home. I'm afraid that there is an inconsistency between the heart of God for the lost and the heart of his church for the lost. And we got to fix it. We got to fix it. We got to bring it back together. Let me illustrate this in a way that, that may make it more clear. Go to Matthew chapter 18. Most of us who've been in the church, our lives know Matthew 18. We know all about it. It's this process. Matthew 18, verses 15, 16, and 17. We sometimes call it, I've sometimes called it, the process of disfellowship. These are the steps, listen to me, I want you to pick up on my language. These are the steps towards disfellowship. Once all of these steps are completed, we mark them. Almost everything I said was idiotic just then because of the way that I said it. Let me show you. Look at verses 15. 
If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take a couple people with you. Take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Let's get everybody involved. The woman searching for the coin. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Sometimes I think we read this like, let's go ahead and get through these three steps and then we put them away. These steps are designed to keep from having to put them away. This is a process for fellowship, not disfellowship. This is what we're going to do to try and get them back. We don't want to write them off. I think some people look at the local church like, well, we just kind of want the strong ones here. You know, we want the good ones here. And the others, you know, they, they, they know where we are. They know where we are. Hey, you want to come back? You know when we meet and where we are. Who are we? Because that's not Jesus. That's not God. I'll tell you one of the things that we could learn from this second parable is that the woman needs to be like her husband. The woman is the church. The husband is Jesus. If there is someone in our fellowship who has distanced themselves from the Lord, get in your car and go to their home and tell them how much God loves them. And if they're not able to hear you, you go find two or three Christians who love them and who care and let's get over there and let's try to help them and let's beg them. And let's tell them they don't owe us anything except to turn back to God. And then when we, how many of you know that by the time we bring it before the church, it's like, okay, official announcement. Turn this thing up, somebody, so I can really sound official. I mean, I'm not talking about Lindell specifically. I'm talking about the church in my whole history. Okay, official announcement, church. We've got somebody who's been gone for eight months, taking them off the roll. Stand up for our closing prayer. What's wrong with us? Why aren't we like the woman? Why isn't that coin so precious that I don't even want to... Well, we're shepherds. We've got elders here. You don't even want to face God with that lost coin if it was in your power to find it. Let's get the church together and let's be like Jesus and let's go rally around their house. Let's bring them home. That's the way God loves. We are his hands. We act on his behalf. Let's be more like him. That story has helped me with that so much and so tremendously. Go back to Luke and we'll finish. Now, in a sense, this last one is longer. And you think we might need a lot of time for it, but we don't. I felt like the first two are the ones that, that have this kind of interesting meaning that needs to be examined. The third one is, is, and I don't mean this in any insulting way to Jesus or anyone, but it's kind of the most dumbed down version. It's like, okay, guys, to the Pharisees. Like, all right, guys, if you didn't pick up what I was talking about, let me ratchet this thing up. It's an actual living human man. And he has two children and he loses one of his children. And I'm going to give them all speaking roles. So you can't miss it. I'm going to go ahead and fill it all in. It's not an inanimate coin or a dumb sheep. It's speaking. So let's just walk through it together. Let's walk through it. Because what you're going to find is both of our points we've made so far in this story. Point one, Jesus is coming to get you and he wants you and he will receive you every single time that you turn to him. Point number two, we as God's people need to be more like, need to be more like that. Now watch this. Pick up with me in our text. We'll just do a little bit of reading. Let's read verses 11 through 16. One read through and we'll be done. He said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country and he squandered his estate with loose living. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country. You might want to write God's providence right there. A severe famine occurred in the country and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving him anything to eat. And so here's our story. A man leaves God. He leaves the comforts of God and he finds out that people don't love him like God loves him. And the world doesn't love him like Christians love him. And so he finds himself in the destitute realities of the, the disintegration of the physical world. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I'm dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned in your sight and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and he came to his father. There's penitence. Penitence isn't paying it back. Penitence isn't making it up. 
Penitence isn't reversing all of your steps. Sometimes I think we go, oh, I've walked this far away from God. I got to like retrace and repair all. Just turn around and run. That's all he had to do. And here's what happened. Verse 20. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And and that's all he does. I don't know if he says anything to him. He just grabs him. And as I said earlier, it's the son who's kind of explaining himself. Father, and he's repenting, which is good. He's verbally confessing his sins. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And you know, he said earlier that he was going to say something else in verse 19. Remember that? In verse 19, he said, when I get home, he's rehearsing it, you know. When I get home, I'm going to say, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So when he actually gets back, he says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And it's almost like the the father stops him. Just stop right there. Don't even say the rest. Stop right there. Slaves, go get the best robe. Go get the ring. Go get the sandals. Go kill the fattened calf. Let's create a meal. Let's celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. This is the relationship. I'm going to show you this and then we're done. This is the relationship between the father and the one who has lost his way. Are you that one? There may be someone here. The father and the one who has lost his way. All you have to do is turn and look to the father and repent of your paths and let him do the rest. He will provide. He will restore. He will help you. But there's more, isn't there? That connects to me. That section connects to the shepherd and the sheep. Very similar. Shepherd and the sheep, father and the son. But then we get the rest of this. What's the rest of this about? Pick up in verse 25. What an interesting section we have. I've titled this in my lesson. You can pick it up in the back. I don't have any slides. We have notes. The first half of this parable is the father and the one who lost his way. The second half of the parable is the father and the son who lost his heart. Oh, that's interesting. So you can run away from God and have a heart for him and come back. We saw that. Or you can stay with God and lose your heart for others. Hey, who's better off? Anybody want to guess? I don't know. Neither. Let's pick up in the read. Now his older son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I've been serving you. Oh, pronoun marking opportunity. Pronoun marking opportunity. If you got a pencil, don't miss these. The story is about a wayward son being restored to his father. It's not about you, dude. But to him it was. For so many years I have been serving you. I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet you've never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when, oh, I like this. He's not like when my brother got home. When this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you have always been with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. Do you think uh, the son who left had any kind of like self-induced PTSD from his trip? You think he came back just feeling like garbage? You think he came back feeling like he'd wasted everything and he was worthy of nothing and he was just always less than the other brother? I would imagine he came back feeling all of that. Does it look like this brother is going to help him through any of that? Does it look like it? He didn't even come to his celebration party. You think he's going to go spend some time with him? Walk him through a few things? Help him get over his guilt? No! The brother is just focused on himself. And so I have a call for this church. One, 
We have to love one another enough that when any of the coins on this necklace fall into the corner of a dark room, we sweep the floor. We go and we go and we go and we love and we welcome and we use passages and providence and people and we don't have an announcement of a disfellowship. We have an announcement of, guys, let's everybody go. But you know, if we'll do that, then when people do come back, we will rally around them, we will study with them, pray with them, support them, open our homes to them, and love them. Here's my argument. The two qualities stand together or fall together. Does that make sense? If you're someone who's seeking for the lost out of a heart for God, when they come back, you're going to wrap your arms around them. And I don't just mean one time up here. If you're someone who doesn't focus on those who are lost and does not have the heart for the Lord, there's a solid chance that when people do come back, you aren't a part of helping them figure this thing out. You want to talk about a 2022 mission? What if I printed up, I'm talking about members at this point. We've got some great news tonight about new members here in the last, I don't want to let anything good go. Can I just say one thing? There are 110 new members at this church in the last 24 months. 100 people have joined this church since COVID started. Think about that. Awesome. It's great. We're all working in the field. You know, we're doing our thing. But in those same two years, what if we presented a list of people who've drifted away from God? It's not that many. But how many does it need to be? Dan, how many does it need to be? That's all it needs to be. Off we go. I'm thankful for the heart of God. And if you have lost your way, the heart of God is welcoming you, will take you in his arms, has come to call your voice and will put you on his shoulders and carry you home. And may we as God's people be his hands in this life and make the assembly of the righteous the most uplifting, comforting, loving place in the world. That's who we are. If that's who you want to be, come now as we stand and sing.